I'm Catherine Reed Day, host of the St. Paul Forum, and coming up next, I'm speaking with Mark Anderson of the M2 Foundation about mindfulness and schools. That's next on the St. Paul Forum. Welcome to the St. Paul Forum. I'm Catherine Reed Day, and joining me today is Mark Anderson of the M2 Foundation. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Nice to be here, Catherine. Great to have you. So, first of all, I'm curious. Tell us a little bit about sort of where you came from. What is your story here in Minnesota? Well, uh, I grew up in Austin, Minnesota, small town near the Iowa border. And early, early on, I got interested in music. I think something happened when Santana's Abraxas record came out, and some ancient uh, spark was reignited in me, and I got very interested in non-Western percussion, which is the, the path that I, I took into music, and eventually moved up to the Twin Cities, met a guitar player named Steve Tibbetts while I was playing in pop bands and all kinds, just trying to learn how to play. Uh, met Steve, and he and I started making records together, and that actually was a really fruitful relationship, which continues to this day. We made a bunch of records for ECM, and I, while I did that, uh, experimented with all kinds of different music and genres, and met a West African guy, and studied Ghanaian drumming, and started going to New York, and studied frame drumming with Glenn Velez, and, and Haitian uh, ceremonial drumming. And, okay, and some of those names I have to admit, won't mean a thing to me. So what I'm wondering about is, is uh, tell us a little bit about, you've decided, we're going to talk about the M2 Foundation, but yeah. you've decided to do a really big event. The, this show is going to run after it's already over, but people will be able to learn about it. Tell us why you decided to bring this Playing for Change to the Twin Cities and maybe help us connect the dots to these African roots that you were just talking about. Sure. Well, Playing for Change, as many people know, uh, is a global nonprofit organization that raises money to support music education around the world. And uh, Beth Barron, who works with M2, ran across a, an email or something on the internet about this, this global fundraising day. And they were inviting organizations and artists to collaborate with them on creating events around the world. So we'll be part of... So it's a worldwide... It's a worldwide movement. event. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, so we, you know, we had to think it through. M2 is a young nonprofit organization that's teaching mindfulness in the community. And we use music, so it was a, it's a fit for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided that we wanted... There were at least two benefits or two ways that this made sense to us. We want to support their work, number one. So the playing for change. Playing for work. change, mm -hmm. yeah. The, uh, and you know, I advocate and support and uh, am vocal about my support for music education around the world and in the community. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've long been associated with schools and led drum groups all over the Twin Cities. So, uh, so that's a natural fit. And then uh, it, we felt like it was a good partnership for us to uh, kind of increase our visibility and our, our credibility and our you know partnership in the community and the way we want to be in the community what our what our status is in the community in terms of the kind of work we're doing and the the people that we're associating with so right and so tell us a little bit about talk a little bit about music I mean I've been influenced my whole, from such an early age around music, and I think it's such an incredibly healing um, component of our lives. But talk a little bit about why you think it's important to uh, share music in the way that you're talking about. Well, I think it's important to share music primarily, actually, because of what you said, because I think it's healing. I mean, as a musician, I've been a musician since I was a kid, um, as a musician, I think what you know intuitively, whether or not you can articulate it or not, is that the reason that people are drawn to it, the reason you 
The only reason some kid holes himself up in a, his bedroom, you know, for three years and learns chords is that it's healing. There's something pleasing. There's just something that connects to our spirit and our heart and something that's bigger than us. And it, it has all of the elements that we also see in other activities that people will describe as really joyful and purposeful, which are it takes commitment, it takes dedication, it's kind of never ending. You don't reach, you never reach the end of learning how to play music. And at the same time, there's something completely magical that nobody can really describe. So it's, it's such a deeply rooted human activity with such power really to heal that uh, I, I just think that it's so important that we remember that and that we not only remember it, but we continue to celebrate it as in communities because it's, the, it's those activities that remind us that we are all connected. Mm -hmm. So when we separate ourselves and we don't practice being in community, it starts to look like we're alone, mm -hmm. although I, I don't think that that's ever true. And at the same time, while we may be inherently connected, if we don't actually practice it, if we don't actualize it, we lose that sense and then we feel disconnected from each other. So when you were growing up in Austin, did you feel that, uh, were you allowed to be musical? Did it stay, was it accepted? Did people say you can't make a living doing that? Did you get discouraged? I was ever? pretty encouraged. You were? Yeah, I was so pretty encouraged. Yep. Mm -hmm. My parents were both encouraging and uh, you know, in, in school, I, d I didn't really take it that seriously in school, even though I was playing when I was young. I didn't, you know, I wasn't in high school band, and, but I was in rock bands. So I was kind of like <laughs> street, it was kind of more the street side that I uh, tended to, but I got a lot of support. So given that experience, I'm just sort of curious, uh, coming from that, that from a, a female perspective, um, the band environment isn't necessarily conducive. Girls are not necessarily encouraged in that way. Um, do you still think that's true? Are, are women, yeah, is it important for women to be involved in experimenting in music at an early age? I th yeah, I think it's important for women too. And yeah, and for, for some reason still, although I do think it's changed quite a bit, um, it hasn't changed nearly enough and it hasn't kept up with many other fields. So if you, you know, you go see bands and it's, it's guys mm -hmm. most of the time. Yeah. So in this concert that you're going to do, this playing for change, um, talk a little bit about what the global objectives are. What are we? What are they trying to accomplish, and and why did that speak to you? Well, they're trying to they're trying to raise money to support uh, music education, and there are lots of places in the world where you know because of financial lack of financial resources, it's just not possible. There are also other places in the world, like right here, <laughs> where somehow as a culture, as a society, despite all of the evidence, scientific-based evidence and experiential evidence, despite that, the first thing that gets cut in schools is uh, music, art, and physical education. Even though all of us know that we feel better when we ride our bike, we feel better when we learn to play an instrument or sing in the choir and all of those things, we still do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we have to make efforts to um, to secure the resources so that it's available to kids. You know, uh, we've had um, the former principal of Gordon Parks High School on the show. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love if you go into that school, which is an alternative high school, encouraging uh, a little bit older uh, young people to finish their their get their GED or their diploma. Um, but they have a beautiful piano in their lobby. It's been painted. And the students are allowed to actually just go down, leave a class and go down and play and go back to class. It's, it's, it, and I've been there when one of the children has done, you know, one of the children, I call them, you know, young adults has done mm -hmm. that. And they just, you know, you can see a physical change in that student. They get down there and they hammer on the piano and it fills this beautiful space in the building. And then they go back and they can focus again. Um, and like you say, there's the evidence that it contributes to, to we have all this interest in STEM, uh, science, technology, math, education. Um, and we know that music contributes to math uh, abilities. Uh, what do you think the resistance is? Hmm. That's, I, I think that the resistance, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not completely sure, but there's a momentum and uh, well, I, I, 
I guess what I think it is is that we've attached the, the we measure success. So the metric we use for success is like productivity. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, roughly speaking. So, and it's hard to say, the things that really heal us, so playing music or painting a picture or, or even a cooking a meal in a way because the way that that pleasures us or gardening mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that, um, those or drawing a picture, those kinds of activities, uh, they just bring us joy, but they don't necessarily accomplish anything in this, using that kind of metric. And so what, we, what we've, we've gotten to the point where we, the, the thing we value above all else is how much are we going to be able to produce. I mean, even when you listen to the, the news and people are talking about, well, you know, our growth rate is only at 2% and it should be 3%. Like, nobody's talking about, well, like, well, what's our happiness rate? <laughs> Which would, well, there are some people talking about there, it. Well, there <laughs> are. There are. That's true. There are. Mm -hmm. I would be one of them. <laughs> but, uh, but so I think that's where it comes from. So we associate you know, being excellent in science or being excellent in math or being a good writer because those skills are easily placeable into a job that will produce things that we then will feed the economy. Mm -hmm. And we can't see that so much with like if you're in the choir mm -hmm. and you're happy or, you know, despite the fact that, again, there's all kinds of evidence kinds that of evidence. even if you want to do those other things, you would support the activities you know, that make mm -hmm. you happy and make you feel stable and give you focus, you would do those activities even to allow those other things to right. happen. So the work of the M2 Foundation, what is it that you have set about to do? You Are you focusing primarily on encouraging music and mindfulness in the schools? What, tell us a little bit about that purpose. Well, we have programs in schools, and that that's where we started, really, so that I don't know what the percentage of, of our programming is, but it's you know it's more than fifty percent of the programming is in uh, our programming energy is going towards schools. So we have uh, programs, it's a curriculum that does mindfulness training with students, and it includes teaching med basic meditation techniques that are calming and de develop clarity. We work on emotional intelligence. We use music both for focus and uh, community development, but also, you know, if you practice music, you have to learn emotional regulation, you have to learn to cooperate. There's all kinds of things that are embedded in it. We work with nonviolent communication. We work with, you know, address the idea of media use or media addiction, basically, at this point, and how, you know, how it is we can tune into ourselves to really get back to our innate wisdom. Like, what is it that what is it that really animates me? What, what mm -hmm. is it that makes me happy? And we also work with teachers, so we do staff development. The schools that we're in now, we're trying to encourage them to uh, allow us to facilitate a teacher's meditation group because they really need it, not only for themselves, but also so that they can understand why it's important for the kids. So even though the research now is pretty strong, you know, unless the teachers have their own experience with it, I think it's it's too mm -hmm. abstract for them. And the yeah. Well, I was going to say, I mean, we've got this, we're talking about mindfulness and meditation. I think to a lot of people it's very, it is really abstract and it seems very foreign and very different. So when you try to help people understand, when you're working, whether it's with a student or a teacher, what is it that, how do you help them feel comfortable with what you're presenting and how do you bring it into the tangible? Is that part of your instrument? You? Uh, it yes, oh. it, at least it okay. could be. And before you start that, let me just say that if you're just joining us, I'm speaking with Mark Anderson of the M2 Foundation about his work on mindfulness in the schools and in music. So, so you're going to help us experience a little bit about what this is. I am. So this this instrument is called an embira. Uh, there, there. Are different versions of this instrument, uh, probably all over the world, but uh, predominantly on the African continent. And uh, so I'm going to demonstrate, I'm going to, I'll demonstrate how I would use something like this to not only describe, but get somebody to experience what it is I mean when I'm talking about mindfulness. So uh, humans are hardwired to be really attentive to sound. And so I would say all of us, I mean, one of our innate capabilities is to be mindful. 
which is to pay attention to something happening in the present moment with a curious, with curiosity as one of the qualities, and non-judgmentally, mm -hmm. you know, so just like basically receiving the information. And it turns out that sound is one that we're really hardwired for because it's really important to know like how far is the bus away from me when I'm crossing the street or is that a baby crying or a tiger? <laughs> <laughs> so we're, you know, it's really ancient in us. So mm -hmm. we're, we'll, we cue to sound right away. So if I, now this isn't very loud. Usually I'll use like a singing bowl mm -hmm. that'll last longer. Mm -hmm. But what I'm gonna ask you to do is close your eyes for a moment and I'm gonna pluck one of these tines and I'd like you to listen to the sound from the very beginning until you can't hear it anymore. And then usually what I have people do is raise their hand. You can do that if you want or not. Yeah, so now in this case, again, it's not, it, it doesn't last, last very, very long. long. Mm -hmm. And a bowl will last longer. Right. But that, that allows me the opportunity to get people to, that's really all I mean by being mindful. Mm -hmm. So when we do that, and it's pretty easy for virtually anybody. Yeah, anyone can do that. Anybody can do it. <laughs> so when you when I do something like that, and then you know, for me to play, for example, So for me, that's like being around water, you know. It reminds I mean, me of water, Yeah, too. it just feels like water. And we all know that that just, for most people, is a calming uh, presence because it's like so musical. I just saw a quote this morning, um, Joseph Campbell saying, eternity is not the past or the future. Uh, the eternity is in the now. Yes. And I, I don't know if I've ever heard that quote before, but to me, listening to that, it's, it's just that, you know, it wakes you up as well as calms you down at the same time. So it's kind of paradoxical to me. Well, I, I think it does seem paradoxical to people, and I don't know if that's if that's uh, it's always been that way, or we're just more like that now. Mm -hmm. But so to be calm and alert seems to be strange to most people. But in fact, that's. Like that, that's when what you, we're supposed to be, isn't right, it? Right. That's how mm -hmm. we're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So when you go to your surgeon, you're betting on <laughs> her being calm and alert right. at the same time. And that skill we can develop. So that's the skill when Yo-Yo Ma plays cello. Mm -hmm. That's the skill we're celebrating, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of other things that seem magical or something to me. But in a way, that's the skill. Or when Michael Jordan was playing basketball, that's that was part of what we celebrated in that was like, Wow, it, that's amazing when mm -hmm. a human being commits themselves that way and they're that present that they, that they just seem to develop almost like a superpower. And in my mind, mindfulness is the superpower, or at least it's the gateway. Because if we, so another way I describe being present, so when I play, for example, I have to bring myself mm -hmm. to the instrument. Right. And I didn't know what I was going to play, and so I just improvised a thing. So not only am I concentrating on, you know, where are my thumbs, and <laughs> which actually I'm like, yes, you're not conscious. I'm not even thinking conscious about that. doing mm -hmm. that, which is part of also part mm -hmm. of mindfulness. It's not discriminative thinking. It's that deeper intuitive wisdom that we all have, mm -hmm. and that we can develop. So I call on that deeper intuitive wisdom, and then I'm also staying present in the way that a Yo-Yo Ma would or Michael would or whatever, to what, what's now transpiring in the moment. So it's not, I'm just not just relying on, you know, I've sat around and played this, you know, a thousand hours. Uh, I'm not relying on that. I'm relying on what's actually happening. And so at a really rapid rate, I'm involved in a call and response circle mm -hmm. or feedback loop or something where it's like, oh, I played that 
and but well, I'm not thinking it. You yeah, know, it's like I'm responding to what just happened, which is what right. musicians are doing all the time. All the time. So I'm thinking that if this were part of a, a, a school environment, that it could be very powerful for the children and for the for the teachers both, as you said. Can you tell us some specifics about where you've what results you've heard? What what is it that people are saying about their experience, and what what do you know is happening in the schools? And is this and just by the way, is this strictly in the Twin Cities, or is this a statewide initiative? What, where are you focused? Uh, right now, M2, all of the M2 programs, the, all the M2 school programs are in St. Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not, we don't feel like we have to stay exclusively in St. Paul. It just so happens that's the case. We haven't thought about going out state yet. I think. And are they all public schools, charter schools? No, a combination of public and charter and. M other set. I mean, charters are technically public as well, but um, right. Mm. We we aren't in any private schools right now, but we're not. We're so the public to schools have said this is important to them. I mean, that's mm -hmm. it seems to me a litmus test of of the uh, importance of it. And mm -hmm. and are they at all ages, or is it focusing on a particular? Yeah, all we're working with all ages, mm -hmm. and I mean, I'm also an adjunct professor at Hamlin, and I'm doing mindfulness. Uh, classes and work there as well. So we're working with all age students. So the goal, talk a little bit further, I don't think we've really covered what the, the goals are of, of the M2 <clears throat> work. So your hope through this process is to engage uh, students and teachers in, in the layers of mindfulness work in hopes of them e expanding their learning experiences and their ability to cooperate be a be a productive person. Yeah, we're we we're advocating. I think really for, I mean, I think we're advocating for a paradigm shift. So, uh, by very specifically addressing uh, issues like lack of concentration, uh, conflict and disruption in the classroom based on emotional. Mm -hmm. Not not having the ability to regulate emotionally, teacher burnout, uh, disconnection between teachers and students. You know the way that communication can break down. In our view, all of those are addressed through mindfulness. And uh, furthermore, our view is that something has shifted, and this kind of goes back to your earlier question about like why we why do we cut things like music? I think the paradigm is flipped upside down somehow. And we don't think of wellness, like human wellness and flourishing, as the fundamental platform from which you would do anything, mm -hmm. like whatever it is you're going to study. If that piece isn't taken care of, then you, it's like tying one hand behind your back or something. So when we work in schools, we've worked in schools where uh, uh, schools that kind of specialize with kids that with have, that have behavior disorders. Mm -hmm. So it's the most dip, disrupted schools. Well, they can't. Those kids are so broken and are wounded mm -hmm. somehow that for to bring them in and then like you, you you're going to read or you know you're going to work do algebra or something. It's a struggle for them to just for just to be in the room in mm -hmm. a group, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they were born that that way. It's because their circumstances have led them to that. And you know, one thing that I've, I'm trying to be careful about with them too is that it, it doesn't get kind of pigeonholed as this, like this uh, remedy or something for mm -hmm. kids that are disrupted, because guess what? You can go to that school and you can go to Edina or you can go to St. Paul Academy, you can go anywhere, and kids are stressed out teachers are stressed out, people are burnt out, mm -hmm. people are scared about their future, people feel whatever. Mm -hmm. They just it just comes in different mm -hmm. in looks different, different in different it looks cases. different. Actually, yeah, the stress um, the scheduling stress even for kids is so uh, and parents is so is so high that anything that's going to calm people and help them seems to me to be just a huge benefit to to any environment. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it doesn't need to be segregated as you say into a certain kind of environment. Mm -hmm. So uh, as people think about, so what we hope is that even though the concert will have come and gone, people will get a chance to go and look on your website and see what Playing for Change did. They would still have a chance to donate, is that right, yep. to, to Playing right. for Change and contribute? Yep. Um, and um, I'm wondering too if, if 
we are, have any teachers or parents watching who would like to have this kind of program in the schools or want, just want to know more about it, uh, what do you, besides going to the, the website, how do you think they could um, be introduced to what you're doing and learn a little bit more? Is there anything else that we could offer them? Yeah, in addition to the website, I mean, they could contact me personally, for one thing, and I would be glad to correspond with them. But there's a lot of information. I mean, these days, uh, virtually every day or every other day, the Huffington Post, New York Times, some major magazine, uh, Richie Davidson, who's at UW-Madison, is the leading uh, research scientist in the world on mindfulness and uh, education and mindfulness and its benefits and basic benefits. So there's a, a virtual explosion of information. So, I mean, you can, if you Google mindfulness and mm -hmm. relative to anything, mindfulness relative to education, mindfulness relative to health, mindfulness relative to recovering from cancer, you'll find just a ton of information. So I would recommend that. M2 uh, besides our school programs, M2 also, uh, we host eight secular meditation sessions every week in St. Paul. One of them is in Minneapolis at Pathways, but all the others are in St. Paul. They're free, they're secular. And where are they located? Uh, mind different roads. Different places? Yeah, different places. Okay, so people need to look at Yeah, go to the website and you sites. can find them. But the, yeah. And Pathways, we have done a show on Pathways uh, in the past. It's in our archive, and all their services are free yeah. uh, if you meet the criteria. Uh, so that's important, and I assume that they're accessible pricing for the other sessions that you do? Actually, all of our, all of our neighborhood meditation sessions are also free. We accept wow. donations for mm -hmm. them. But uh, our idea is really that these days, you know, most people are have some familiarity with the idea of meditation. Lots of people have either tried it and can't keep their practice going or something, or else they feel like, oh, I probably should. Yeah. <laughs> and so we just decided, well, we started thinking about it, like, well, what's the obstacles if everybody feels that way or, you know, large. So let's, let's make it easy. Yeah, let's make it easy. Mm -hmm. Free, close by, and Very nice. not related to any particular religious tradition. So we'll make sure that your website is up so that people can find that schedule for some mindfulness classes great. and sessions. Uh, that's great because I'll probably be signing up. Good. <laughs> Good. It would be great to see you there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, is there any little last thought about playing for change or about M2 that you want to impart before we close? Well, I'm, I want to say that uh, we're excited about the concert. I think it's a great opportunity. And one of the, one of the uh, I think, biggest pieces of that, that and then the work that we're doing, is that um, it's, it's really gratifying to see the kind of feedback that we're getting and that there's just more recognition. And what I see is it's a recognition of uh, a more broad recognition that we need to do something. Like we, people need to stand up. They need to take action and do something, to so that we realize our connected with each w connectedness with each other. So that there's actually going to be a place for our grandkids to to be to because be. we really do have to do something about it. We can't just sit on the sidelines. Great. Well, thank you. That's all we have time for. Come join us again next week on the St. Paul Forum.